Oh my no, God. God. Hell no, man. What no, the fuck, God. man? Please, no. This is no. so bad. No. My head is your guy. No. Oh, man. Hollywood always seems to like depicting programmers as though they're reading and manipulating individual bits by hand. Like, every programmer begins their journey learning that their program has to start with hex 7 f 454 c 46 because Santa's workshop is run by elves. It's more likely that a programmer's first Hello World program would look something like this, which is so much easier to understand. Right? Well, this is only easier for us to understand, but it's no joke that a computer would be more likely to understand the Hello World program shown earlier. So how do we go from rubbish to bin? The natural approach one would think of is to just translate the higher level programming language into lower level binary that the computer can understand. This is achieved with a compiler. But this is not the only way. What you can do instead is provide a separate binary that, when executed, reads your program and tells the computer what to do according to what the program says. This is called an interpreter. For example, suppose you wanted to read Les éléments de géométrie algébrique, but you don't speak French. Ignoring the fact that the language is not the barrier to understanding the book, there are two solutions to this problem. The compiler solution would be to have the book translated to English, which you would only need to do once, but it might take some time for this to happen. The interpreter solution would be to get your good friend Lumière 33 to read the book to you, translating on the fly. While this would have more immediate feedback, you would need to bring him around with you every time you needed to read something in the book. At this high level, the difference between a compiled and interpreted language seems clear as day, but this is only true if you live in London. Let's look at Python. It's pretty obviously an interpreted language, right? I mean, after all, if I wanted to run this program, I need to provide a Python interpreter. Wait, you don't know Python? Don't worry, I've got you covered. I've already made a video that covers everything you need to know about Python. Ignore the publication date of the video. I promise, it really teaches you Python. What? Realize you can't actually learn programming without actually programming and grinding through numerous problems and making your own software? then you should check out today's sponsor, boot.dev. I'm sure we've all derived joy from tricking a rock into causing seg faults, but the novelty when acquiring new skills in programming wears off well before we get a chance to really learn that skill. Boot.dev gives you an extra boost of motivation when trying to solidify your programming skills by presenting the otherwise potentially mind-numbing grind into an RPG. You can earn XP and achievements, complete quests, and fight bosses, all from learning useful real-world skills in the meantime. This is achieved by taking their highly interactive courses aimed around learning back-end web development from start to finish in Python, SQL, and Go, or, or TypeScript if you're into that sort of thing. Even if you don't want to become a back-end web dev, a lot of these courses will still offer valuable skills for other programming careers, such as knowing your way around a Linux server, or being able to use Git for more than just cloning and force pushing commits into main, or doing more with Docker than just pulling existing images just because the downstream repo doesn't properly document its environment variables. Go to boot.dev and use the code SHIFIFICATION to get 25% off your entire first year with an annual plan. Thank you so much to boot.dev for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to how Python is obviously an interpreted language. As a matter of fact, the Python interpreter doesn't actually execute Python programs line by line like a traditional interpreter would. Instead, it converts your program into bytecode.pyc files that can run in the Python virtual machine. This means that the Python binary arguably provides a compiler for the virtual machine and an emulator for that machine. Okay, sure, Python bytecode is still being interpreted, and this time in the traditional sense, so maybe this doesn't count to you. However, please keep in mind that this reasoning seems to be good enough for Wikipedia. Also, you forgot about Python's most popular compiler, Schmodex. <laughs> We could split hairs forever, but I prefer to split epis, because whether some languages count as interpreted is completely up to choice. Let's instead focus on a more unambiguously interpreted language, C++. Python and C++ are two of the most popular languages out there right now, proving again that what's popular isn't always what's right. But in any case, people are generally pretty religious about their programming languages, so of course you can find plenty of discussions pitting Python and C++ against each other. Not that I'd ever do something like that. 
The conclusion of these often civil and courteous discussions is that Python is excellent for prototyping, but when you care about speed, C++ is the way to go. To demonstrate this, I wrote a simple integer calculator in C++ and Python. It doesn't do anything fancy, it just takes two integers and a binary operation between them and computes the result of the expression. We can see that the C++ version also does the same thing. Oh, right, silly me. You can't just execute C++ files like this. Like I've been telling you, C++ is an interpreted language, so we need to provide an interpreter in order to run the program. There are a couple of good interpreters out there, but G++ in particular is based. So, what we need to do is feed our calculator source code to G++. One great thing about C++ is that it operates on a pay-for-what-you-use model. This helps keep C++ from becoming a bloated and confusing mess despite being over 40 years old. The standard updates every few years, and my calculator uses features from 2023. C++ interpreters also usually write their output to an a.out file to avoid cluttering your terminal, but we'll write to standard out. These are the same flags as you'd use if you were using Clang, but remember, what sets G++ apart is that it's based. Now, we can type in an expression, and the behavior is exactly the same as the Python calculator. Well, you know, except for when it isn't. Petty differences aside, did you feel the difference? I'm sure you did if you care at all about speed. Python takes around a tenth of a second to evaluate 608 times 36, but C++ on the other hand... But gee, I hear you ask. If Python is so much faster, then why doesn't everyone use Python in general? This is a very natural question. Why don't we port those three billion devices to use Python instead? Well, as usual, it's all about trade-offs. Sure, you get outstanding performance from Python, but it comes at the cost of people writing completely incomprehensible source code. I mean, this is the calculator program, but what the duck is this actually quacking? On the other hand, the C++ source code is significantly more readable. You may be wondering why all the keywords in C++ seem to end with an underscore. The reason this is so much more readable is twofold. First, you gain readability by abstracting a lot of complication behind a really good standard library. Secondly, readability can be gained from having a simple execution model, which in G++ is handled by the GIL, which stands for the Global Interpreter Li <coughs> the GNU Interface Layer. You can find an implementation of the GIL on my GitHub. I'm sure you're still confused, so let's sort this out by walking through the implementation of an algorithm. This is not a C++ tutorial channel, and some may argue it shouldn't be anyway. But if it were, I'd probably show you how to implement merge <laughs> What? I'm not going to teach you merge sort. Fine, maybe we can meet in the middle. I'll at least show you pseudocode along the way so that the implementation is easier to follow. In C++, the entry point for execution is main. Here's pseudocode for a main function that does nothing. In actual C++, the main function looks quite similar, but you need to be explicit about actually executing main. Here we indicate that we want to run automatically, and that this run may have side effects. Speaking of side effects, we should get main to do something. Before implementing merge sort, let's just have it read an array and print it out. What you might notice, which I try to reflect in the pseudocode, is that you need to enumerate your symbols ahead of time. This may seem old-fashioned, but you get used to it. Reading the array is simple. We're taking a comma-separated list of integers until we don't read any more commas. Since this is peripheral to the actual merge sort function, we can implement it in a macro. Macros are a kind of pre-processing step that, rather than executing code, instead just inserts tokens directly into your program. They're mainly there for convenience, but they can get pretty hairy since they can have unexpected side effects of their own. In C++, these macros are called static constant expressions and are declared accordingly. Printing out the array will similarly be handled with a macro. However, one thing of note is that C++ macros, uh, static constant expressions, can also use scoped local variables. 
All you have to do is allocate at least one local stack and you're good to go. Now that we've got the preliminary boilerplate out of the way, we can actually implement merge sort. Since merge sort is a recursive algorithm, macros are probably not the way to go. Instead, we'll actually implement a function. As the pseudocode suggests, we need to take the array by reference, but we can take the lower and upper bounds by value. Translating to C++, we need to introduce symbols for the merge sort function and its function parameters. We declare a function with the fn keyword, and we'll make this function global to make calling it recursively easier. Actually invoking merge sort is a bit trickier thanks to C++ reference semantics, which can really feel like a can of worms. Variables in C++ are passed around by reference by default, and although most operations on them will implicitly dereference the variables, sometimes you need to dereference them explicitly by prepending an asterisk. Cases where you need to explicitly dereference variables include copying the value of one variable to another, indexing into an array, calling a function, and passing variable arguments to a function by value. However, I just mentioned that we need to pass the array by reference. This is because it's not actually possible to pass arrays by value in C++. Passing by reference is achieved by prepending an ampersand. Alright, let's get to merging together a sorting algorithm. We do the usual divide and conquer, sorting the lower and upper halves. Note that the array function argument is a variable whose value is a reference to an array. In order to pass a reference to the array this variable holds, we need to dereference the variable. Otherwise, we'll get a reference to a reference to the array. This can be confusing, but simply don't be confused. Anyway, now that the individual halves are sorted, we uh, merge. Yes, I know you can avoid using an auxiliary array for the merging, but why are you watching a mathematician program if you care about performance? Again, because the array variable holds a reference to the underlying array, we need to dereference once to expose the reference to the underlying array, but then dereference again to actually get the array. So there we have it, a complete implementation of merge sort in C++. There is just one more thing to do. Since programmers who use interpreted languages often feel a deep-seated inferiority to programmers who use compiled languages, they often hide behind a layer of abstraction by giving their source code executable permissions. In order for this to work, the program loader needs to be able to find the interpreter. On Unix-like systems, this is normally done with a shebang. However, C++ doesn't support shebangs. Hope is not lost. Without a shebang, the program loader will usually assume the source is a shell script. We can use this fallback to finagle load instructions on top of our C++ file thanks to the fact that redundant slashes are ignored when specifying paths. Therefore, we can add the based G++ incantation to the top of our source file and readily make it executable. Note that you need to add an unconditional exit at the end, or else the shell will try to execute your actual C++ source code that sits below it. With that final touch, we can sort a comma-separated list of 7 integers in Four and a half minutes. Oh, good. You're probably wondering how C++ executes your code. The execution is done using the C++ abstract machine. The abstract machine is quite simple and consists of three main components. State tracks the values of all variables used by the program. Stood in holds a buffer with all the user input. Stood out holds a buffer with all the output to be written upon termination. The abstract machine also has a very limited ISA. Each instruction defines a rule for transforming the abstract machine from any input runtime state to another one. The execution of a program amounts to compounding these transformations together. You could, in principle, write abstract machine instructions directly but the standard library provides us an additional layer of abstraction to make programming much easier, which is where we get all of the underscore suffixed keywords. If we look at the implementation of main, for example, we see that it actually does a bit of boilerplate to set up the runtime, and then invokes C++'s actual entry point, which is the start symbol. Then it feeds your source code into this interpreter engine. The role of the interpreter engine is to expand your C++ source code line by line into abstract machine instructions, and then executes them. 
Interpreting your code may have side effects on the state of the abstract machine and may return a value, so the interpreter engine tracks both separately. For example, here is how the interpreter handles an assignment operator. It first evaluates the left and right hand expressions of the assignment operator, each of which may have side effects. The return value of an assignment expression is the value being assigned, and the side effect of the assignment is expressed by executing the abstract machine instruction set. <laughs> if you think about it, you could say that this interpreter engine is actually a JIT compiler. This gives some idea how the C++ interpreter works. But now the problem is, how does the C++ abstract machine interface with your actual machine? When you execute volatile auto run equals main, what's actually happening is that the code is run and then stood out is converted into a string literal, that is, a sequence of bytes, and mapped to the run symbol. In other words, to read the program output, you need to find and read the run symbol. How about the input? Well, if we look at the abstract machine entry point, the start symbol, we can see that the entry point initializes a runtime with an empty state, an empty output string, and an input string that is initialized to some symbol dunder standard in. These two special symbols are the endpoints through which your computer interfaces with the C++ abstract machine. But how do we actually use this interface? Let's first talk about how to deal with output. All we have to do is link the run symbol to the console. Linking symbols generated by G++ is handled by the linker, so all we have to do is provide a suitable linker script. Of course, the GIL provides a suitable linker script for you under the folder for the abstract system emulator drivers. So that handles output, but to handle input, Rather than reading from a symbol, we need to provide a symbol. This is handled by the other abstract system emulator driver provided by GIL, called CC1+. This driver provides some helpful debugging utilities because C++ errors are... But the main thing this driver does is take console input and then pass the string as the dunder standard in symbol as a macro. This little maneuver here is only possible using G++. If you were to use Clang, you'd have to implement this instead with a front-end plugin. This is why G++ is indeed based. If you're still here, thank you for watching. If you liked what you watched, you may need to get some help. If you didn't like what you watched, then why don't you fork off the repository and do it better? I'll only consider it a deep cut if your metaprogramming language is procedural and built on C++11. If you still didn't like what you watched, you'll be glad to know that this unholy mess has caused me a great deal of grief and might have been the biggest waste of time I've ever committed to, and I got a PhD in pure math. Despite my best efforts, it's nearly impossible to debug, and a 2KB file has no right to generate 14 megabytes of error messages. But even in my most heated moments, I can always count on that one fan to cool me back down.